Hi, everyone. Welcome to our next session. This session will be rapid fire talks from the faculty at Rice University. Our first speaker will be Dr. Patel, and I thank him for being here. Hi, everyone. Let me just share my screen here. OK, so I'm going to briefly talk to you guys about uh, understanding neural networks as spline. So my lab works on a variety of different uh, applications of neural networks in uh, natural and biomedical sciences. Uh, but today I want to tell you about some of the core theoretical work we're doing. And these are some of the folks in my lab uh, that have been um, working on this. So um, just briefly, just to give you the punchline ahead of time, since we have very limited time, uh, there are many perplexing phenomena inside neural networks that lack clear theoretical explanations. You may have heard people talk about neural networks as black boxes. So this is what they mean. Um, however, the applications of neural networks, especially for making high accuracy predictions uh, in biomedical sciences and others, has dramatically uh, has, has seen dramatic advances in the past uh, five, 10 years. And so the engineering and the applications have outstripped the understanding. So in this work, we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about my lab and other labs efforts to understand uh, the representation inside of neural networks. In other words, we're gonna crack open the black box. And in particular, we're gonna try to understand these neural networks as splines. And splines are a very old type of, of, of nonlinear model. So the implications, at the end I'll circle back and tell you what the implications of this uh, point of view, this new spline point of view is uh, for, for a biomedical application. So very briefly, um, there are many different unexplained phenomena inside of neural networks, which you may, may not have heard of. Um, there's a lot of hype in AI uh, regarding the power of neural networks, but there are a lot of fundamental issues that, are, uh, that still bother us. In particular, over-parameterization. Why do we need neural networks that have way more parameters than training samples, right? If I have a billion parameters and only one million training samples, how could I possibly not overfit? This is probably the most important uh, question uh, about neural networks. Uh, and, and there are other questions about generalization. Um, you know, there are infinitely many ways to fit the training data, right? We have, when you have such an over-parameterized network, um, how could you possibly get good generalization? Right? So, so why are we able to generalize so well in deep learning? So our solution to understanding some of these uh, mysteries uh, was to, to recast or reinterpret neural networks as splines. And the, the simplest way to understand that is it's very simple diamond network shown here in the lower left. Um, just a scalar input, scalar output, and, and some hidden units and a ReLU activation function. And what we do is we reparameterize uh, this network and think of it as a continuous piecewise linear function with certain parameters, uh, so-called breakpoints and delta slopes. Um, so a breakpoint is basically where a slope changes discontinuously, and a delta slope is how much curvature uh, was induced by that change in slope. And so uh, once you see this, you see that training adjusts these breakpoints and delta slopes until the training data or your training loss is matched. This is the most common paradigm in deep learning, uh, and, and it also holds in, in biomedical applications. And this also holds in multiple dimensions, right? So here's a two-dimensional example of a neural network approximating a finite set of training data shown in red. Now, uh, one of the key results from our theoretical work has been that, um, you know, what is the nature of the approximation that a neural network makes? And although this slide looks quite mathy, uh, what I want you to take away is that a neural network is not something magical. It's not an un understandable black box. In fact, it's just a basis expansion, right? So we all uh, may have learned in kindergarten that any function can be approximated with a Taylor series or a Fourier series or whatnot, and which basis you use should depend on some properties of the, of the function you're trying to approximate. And it turns out that neural networks are no different. Neural networks, the key difference between neural networks and other bases is that neural networks, the bases are driven by the data, but it is a basis expansion. So uh, from this point of view, we study these basis expansions, we study the learning dynamics of neural networks. Uh, we have you know, typical ODE systems of how these breakpoints and delta slopes vary. We study how depth uh, impacts how these breakpoints and delta slopes move uh, to get a much deeper understanding of how these things train. Um, and we develop visualizations, as you can see, custom visualizations uh, to, to really understand what's going on inside the black box. And finally, that, that mystery I told you about at the beginning, 
the fact that in a heavily over-parameterized model, what right does it have to generalize? We've actually written theorems uh, that explain this, this mystery. Um, and you can check out our paper for more details. Um, and so, uh, real quick, just to show you how powerful this theory is, here's an example of a neural network in blue and uh, our theoretical prediction in red. And so you see that the neural network converges almost exactly to the theoretical prediction. The theoretical prediction was based on this spline theory. And notice that you don't need neural networks and you don't even need backpropagation in order to understand what the final function that the neural network lands on after training does. So with that, I'll say that um, this neural network as spline point of view is very useful for understanding, as I've tried to show in this talk, but also it's very useful for developing new visualizations, new attribution methods, and uh, new explanations for what neural networks are doing. And in biomedical applications like image segmentation, cancer diagnosis, et cetera, of course, explanations and quantifying uncertainty are very, very important. So uh, with that, I will end this talk and I hope you found it interesting. And if you did, please feel free uh, to contact me and I'd love to discuss more one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Dr. Patel. It was very interesting. I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Ashok Viragovin. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Angela. Uh, my name is Ashok Viragovin. I'm a faculty in the Electrical and Computer Engineering Department here at Rice. And in the next four minutes or so, I'm going to give you a brief flavor of uh, the focus of a group of us working on what we we call ourselves the Scalable Health uh, Laboratory. And I'm going to give you a little bit of a flavor of the research that goes on in our group. Uh, we focus on problems that have to do with bio behavior sensing, bio imaging, and bioelectronics. Uh, I personally work mostly on the bio imaging side, and the rest of this talk is going to be focused on projects that have to do with bio imaging. Uh, but as you can see, we are a wide group of people from bioengineering, from psychology, from uh, electrical and computer engineering, and from Baylor Psychiatry. Uh, and the behavior part of our group involves Ashu Sabarwal, Chris Fagundes, Akane Sano, Margaret, and uh, uh, Briar, and uh, Nidal Mogatan. Uh, on the electronic side, we have Taiyun Chi and Kaiwan uh, Yang, and both of them uh, work on bioelectronics, and myself. Uh, focusing on bioimaging, and the rest of the three minutes will be focused on the imaging applications that we are looking at. Uh, the bioimaging capabilities that we as a team bring to the table include the design of computational cameras. Uh, by this, I mean the holistic co-design of optics, sensors, electronics, and machine learning algorithms in order to achieve imaging functionalities, typically bioimaging functionalities, that are somewhat that have uh, application constraints that are limiting uh, traditional technologies. Another area of interest for us is non-invasive bio, uh, biomarker imaging. So here, how can we use traditional cameras like those on your smartphones and on your laptops to do clinically useful biomarker imaging like imaging blood perfusion, vital signs such as heart rate, heart rate variability, and so on. And finally, uh, using the tools of computer vision and machine learning for uh, diagnosis, monitoring, and prediction for both image-guided diagnosis, image-guided monitoring, and chronic disease analysis. Uh, I'll give you a flavor of each of those three pillars by uh, talking a minute or 30 seconds about specific projects. So here's a project uh, which is uh, within the realm of computational imaging. What's shown here is uh, FlatCam, one of our imaging technologies that is completely lensless, but is able to capture images uh, achieving subcellular imaging resolution, so two micron resolution, uh, uh, while achieving at the same time a large uh, field of view and uh, a thin and light form factor as shown here. The entire camera is shown in the picture on the center. We believe that this kind of uh, miniaturized uh, imaging technologies can uh, have applications in endoscopy, in uh, implantables, in wearables, and also uh, for drone uh, disaster recovery kind of applications. Another core focus of our lab is to use video feeds uh, from normal RGB cameras, the kind that is there in your smartphones, in your uh, laptops, in your uh, uh, tablets, 
to do completely non-invasive health monitoring. Already we have ag algorithms that uh, operate robustly in order to use the uh, cameras to get things like heart rate, heart rate variability, breathing rate, blood oxygenation, and blood perfusion. We are currently working towards extending the, uh, the reliability of these methods while at the same time looking at new biomarkers such as blood pressure and so on. Things that currently cannot be do done uh, without contact but trying to move the needle uh, of non-contact health monitoring. And as I mentioned, a lot of our focus is also on uh, using computer vision and machine learning tools to discover visual features uh, for the purposes of both disease monitoring and personalized interventions. Most of our current projects in this realm have been focused on, uh, on cancer, and we've looked at projects both in histology, radiology, and immunochemistry. Uh, to learn more about us, you can go to sh.rice.edu and you can learn more about our uh, entire team and our research efforts. With that, I'll stop and uh, take any. Thank, Thank you, you so much for being here. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Uh, Dan Daniel Cal. Great. Thank you. So I wanted to just give a quick overview of some of the projects that I'm working on and areas that I'm interested in um, collaborating and, and expanding upon. Uh, so very broadly, I'm interested in large and dependent data analysis. So these large data sets with multivariate observations, temporal, spatial, functional, or, or curved data, covariates, other types of different structures. Um, and I'm particularly interested because these are, of course, challenging problems, but also inferences and decisions are reliable and optimal only when you're accounting for that dependence appropriately. So I typically use Bayesian or hierarchical models to try to model concurrent sources of dependence. So maybe you have time series, spatial data, and covariates. Uh, but we're also trying to build in type, types of regularization, typically through priors for smoothness, shrinkage, sparsity, basically building up a model with flexibility enough to capture these different sources of dependence uh, but enough penalization and regularization to shrink it back down to simplicity if the data allow. Uh, and then the last piece that I'm really interested in right now is once you build up, up these adequate Bayesian models, how do you extract interpretable summaries? How do you make simple decisions uh, that are clear and well motivated from your models, from your complex data? So one example of, of a, a functional time series data that I worked with was measles counts in Texas. So this was historical data. And when I worked on this two years ago, measles was the preeminent infectious disease that we were all concerned about in Texas. Um, in any case, you can see that there are clear seasonality trends. So this is weekly data. These are case counts um, dating back pre and then of course post vaccine. And so what I've done here is just folded in the, below, in the lower plot here, I've just folded these over as a function of time of year. So you can view it as one long time series or as each intra-year curve as a function of time of year. So from one year to the next. So it's a different way to capture that seasonality, which is quite predictable when you see it in this plot. And so one thing we were trying to do was saying, if I only have a small number of uh, observations early on, say pre-March, can I predict the rest of the year using these functional time series models? And effectively we were able to do so with uncertainty quantification, but not just in terms of the number of cases, we we're also interested in saying, when is that peak gonna occur? And so I have, you can get a posterior distribution for the peak time, you can get a posterior distribution for the peak count, you can get uncertainty quantification on these really important epi-related quantities. In another data set, I worked with, uh, this was a, a pinch force data set. So an individual was about motor control, was pinching their fingers um, over time and the force was being measured. And there was this really nice physically motivated parametric model, which I plotted on the left here, which describes the data pretty well. You can see that there are areas where these prediction intervals are a little too wide and there are areas where there is some bias. So I was interested in taking these functional parametric models and tacking on something that's highly flexible, non-parametric functional models, but also with the capability to collapse down to the original model if we're able to. And so on the right, I have the adjusted or corrected version. And so what you can see is that bias has gone away completely and the prediction intervals have narrowed down to where they should be. Uh, and yet the shape of the curve is still maintained. So the primary conclusions are still there. We're just able to eliminate bias and decrease this predictive uncertainty pretty easily, in fact. Uh, more recently, I've been working on uh, high resolution physical activity data. 
So these are minute by minute physical activity, think Fitbit step count type data for four individuals. In each case, this is a function of time of day. So perhaps here the individual took off their monitor. You can see people are more active in the afternoon. And so I built up a functional data model accounting for covariates, different replicates. Um, and of course that ends up being this big messy model. And so I wanted to think of how to come up with interpretable summaries. So how do you summarize things like not just the intraday profile, maybe I wanna know what's your peak activity? How active are you? Are you an individual like this person down here who probably went for a run at some time around 5.30 in the morning or someone like this individual who didn't really do a whole lot the whole day? And so we tried to predict an individual's peak activity, all times of types of different functionals actually, using a subset of linear predictors. So predictors including things like demographics, other basic health information, to try to extract and say, okay, what are the driving predictors of this functional of your activity? Something that's actually interpretable. And using the underlying Bayesian model, using the underlying predictive distribution, we're able to extract, and so what we're looking at here is how many predictors you include versus vertically is how poor you're doing. And so we're able to get down to about 10 or 15 variables where you can predict as well as if you had way more variables in the model. And there's this other component where if you're looking at in sample versus out of sample, so the right hand side is, is sort of the in sample analog. And you see that it's not giving you much useful information. It's, it's just saying keep including more and more variables. So you can actually get a lot out of this predictive uncertainty quantification as well as this out of sample quantity. So to summarize here, I'm looking at large independent data. I'm trying to come up with optimal, but also these interpretable predictions and decision analyses. Um, and the last piece that, that I'm interested in moving into more is, is taking these predictions and decision-making and thinking about fairness. So are we, are we biasing against protected groups? Can we de-bias without losing an, a notion of acceptable accuracy? So thank you. Thank you for more, so much, Daniel. Um, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Myers. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Risa Myers, and I'm an assistant teaching professor in the Department of Computer Science at Rice University. Uh, oops, sorry. This just got messed up. Try again. Uh, so I teach, I'm a, I'm a teaching faculty, so my main focus is teaching, and I teach uh, three different courses. I teach an introduction to database systems class, which covers both relational and NoSQL systems. I teach a data science tools and models class, uh, which is part of our undergraduate data science minor at Rice, which is a very challenging and fun class to teach because I get the sociologists and the geologists and uh, the students who have other primary domain, primary focuses, but are also very interested in learning data science. And starting next semester, I'll be teaching a course in big data. I wear another hat, which is that I'm also a data scientist. I'm part of a research group, the Children's Environmental Health Initiative, which is currently located at the University of Notre Dame. And this group is focused on studying environmental impacts on children's health, in particular with regards to geospatial data. Uh, I'm a little unusual. I have 20 years, over 20 years of experience working in healthcare. Uh, before I went into academia, I worked for uh, hospitals across the street at the Texas Medical Center. I've worked for device manufacturers and so on. So my Talk of the title of my talk is Find Data, Use Data, and Teach Data, which is kind of a riff on that medical education adage of see one, do one, teach one. My main focus right now in research is making somewhat protected or sometimes protected data findable. Right? There was a lot of talk yesterday and also today about data provenance. How do we let people know what data we have so we can encourage collaboration and let people know about our data, but still protect the information within it? For the, the CHI research group, we've put together a, a data hub, chidatahub.org. Uh, there's a QR code here if you want to visit. And what we have is the, the, the group has uh, probably a decade's worth of data sets that they've put together. We've been obtaining digital object identifiers for each of these data sets so they can be cited and they can be found. We have a tile for each one of them explaining, hey, here's what our data set is about. And then in particular, we want to make this data useful, right? both for collaboration uh, with other groups and within the group. So what we've been doing is working on how do we make more information about this data set available? How do we publish the metadata? And we've done this by explaining and putting on the website what geographic extent is covered, what size the database is, uh, what size are the data sets, um, what level of detail geographically does it cover? Does it, is it a particular state? Is it the entire United States? And then for each attribute, we again go into a level of detail where we'll show you, hey, we can't tell you what everybody has, but we can say, here are the possible values for this attribute. Here's what's possibly in there. 
We can tell you if it's calculated, and if it's calculated, what, how did we get there? Is there a reference, a paper, or some other method that tells you, hey, how did we come up with that value? And we also have hyperlinks that say, okay, if this particular value is calculated for some others, we can let you hyperlink to those other attributes to learn more about that. We're also using controlled vocabulary, so again, to make the data more useful and understandable. Um, so we're using, uh, in this case, MESH, the medical subject headings run by, coordinated by the National Library of Medicine to annotate our attributes as well when it makes sense. Uh, we also have a quality uh, tab for many of our data sets. It tells you, in this case right now, so far, how many of the records have been geocoded. The other area of uh, research that I do is what I would call biomedical, uh, biomedical informatics research, and it's really about building machine, lo machine learning models using healthcare data. Things I'm interested in are patient similarity and time series data. Uh, for example, this plot is a graph of a patient's um, intracranial pressure over time, and this is work that was published in Critical Care Medicine, and we're looking at, hey, can we look at a patient over time and predict half an hour or an hour or four hours in the future are they going to go into this crisis mode where they have elevated intracranial pressure? If we can alert someone in time, something can be done to intervene. Finally, I teach, and that's my top priority. Uh, so I'm interested in bringing research and its tools and methods and byproducts back into the classroom. I use real data sets whenever possible, and I'm also interested in innovating and teaching data science to students, especially those from mixed backgrounds, not purely computational. Uh, the team from CHI uh, has been a, a great help in producing the data and, and providing you with this environment. And please join, uh, come visit our website. Happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Myers. We have our final rapid fire talk today, Dr. Merrick Kimmel. Um, I'm very looking forward to hearing his latest research. Well, hello. Uh, I guess you can see me on my screen. So uh, I chose to speak about uh, uh, coronavirus evolution because uh, uh, this is of current interest and also it uh, shows similar methods that uh, uh, with the projects we are currently having with MD Anderson, which are concern, uh, focused on bladder cancer and leukemia. So actually molecular evolution is, uh, can be used in various fields. And I'm, uh, this is uh, a material uh, uh, which is, was developed under NSF uh, Rapid Collaborative Grant with uh, Simon Tavare as a co-PI, and also contributors from uh, uh, RISE, from uh, Sorbonne, and from a university in Poland. And so uh, the questions that we are asking ourselves are about the pattern and rate of evolution of coronavirus species and, su and subspecies, by the way, in light of available data. So, uh, in particular, does the evolution pattern of the human coronavirus indicate uh, acceleration and emergence of new strains? And uh, how uh, st uh, strongly is this under selection, which might lead to uh, evolution of uh, uh, more uh, virulent uh, strains than the current one? And then also another interesting issue is uh, about the hidden depth of the coronavirus uh, family. Uh, which is uh, uh, basically uh, uh, the animal coronaviruses, particularly bat coronaviruses, constitute a reservoir of virus that is uh, shooting uh, some uh, genomes into uh, uh, other animals and humans. And so uh, there was a series of infections uh, which were caused by coronaviruses with it. Uh, past 50 years, and three of them are common colds, three or four are common colds, and there were two very deadly SARS and MERS, and now we have the so-called COVID-19. So how does it happen that uh, the uh, genomes are evolving endemically in bats, and they uh, do not, uh, they jump to humans only from time to time, and what we can expect? Okay, and the approach that we are using is a fusion of stochastic process modeling and statistical methods. And uh, most stochastic models of epidemics focus on uh, the hosts, on transmission to hosts. Now, uh, our method is uh, 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 called, uh, with, uh, related to phylodynamics. So uh, how the virus itself is evolving, considering the embedding host populations as its environment. So virus is uh, embedded in a variable uh, environment, and uh, uh, however unnatural it might uh, uh, sound, 
we are less interested about this environment than in the virus itself. Okay, so uh, uh, I have to be very uh, quick and brief about the methodology. So uh, what uh, one can do, one can uh, assemble statistical characteristics of the existing sample of coronaviruses, which now goes into dozens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands different genomes, and uh, uh, try to figure out whether these statistics indicate uh, influence of selection. So this is what we do with uh, human coronaviruses. And uh, so there are models which uh, can show that uh, statistics known as uh, site frequency spectrum uh, under a certain transformation uh, will have a graph which will be, should be straight line with slope minus one uh, when it is uh, not under selection and evolution is neutral. And indeed, we see that uh, the uh, 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 genomes of human coronaviruses you see my cursor, I hope, uh, are uh, uh, when the site frequency spectra, uh, when drafted, are almost uh, uh, ideally a straight line with this uh, minus one slope, except for a bulge at the end. And this bulge can be traced to certain elements of the genome, uh, of which, I, which I'm not going to discuss now. However, if we look at some fragments of coronavirus genomes, for example, the so-called five prime and three prime uh, untranslated regions, which are green and purple here, you see that there is a large deviation from neutrality here. So these are these uh, regions contain regulatory uh, uh, sequences which might influence the uh, uh, how the virus behaves. Now, there are also some uh, uh, oddities uh, uh, regarding the side frequency spectra of spike and envelope. However, I don't have much time, so I'm not going to discuss them. I would like to show uh, maybe one more slide, which uh, shows uh, uh, something that is very characteristic for the uh, bat coronavirus evolution. I would like to uh, uh, mention, just for, to curiosity, that the uh, number of sequenced whole uh, genomes of bat coronaviruses is small. It's something like 50, which is astounding uh, considering the level of interest in these, uh, uh, in these genomes. I'm afraid that they are sleeping somewhere and uh, 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 unknown to the uh, community at large. But anyway, we uh, used a, a, a very powerful uh, phylodynamics program called BEAST2 which is a real beast, very difficult to use. And uh, uh, so, uh, and we use it to uh, uh, build uh, uh, the phylogenetics trees of bat coronaviruses. And uh, we see that the depth of the root of this tree is uh, uh, at least about 100 years. So this would be the uh, beginning of the coexistence of coronaviruses with, uh, uh, with bats. And also what is interesting is that uh, uh, the uh, effective population size of the virus seems to be constant in time for these past uh, the 60 years. Uh, so this means that uh, uh, this is consistent with the hypothesis that the uh, bat coronaviruses and bats uh, uh, evolve at some sort of an equilibrium which has something to do with the unusual nature of uh, uh, bats' immune system. All right, I, will, uh, I hope that I uh, uh, stimulated your curiosity by uh, this uh, small presentation. And, uh, well, uh, much is to, there are many questions to ask, which uh, uh, hopefully you will answer in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kemmel. Well, that was our rapid fire uh, session. Our next panel is starting in about eight minutes and I will see you guys then.